Welcome in the Matt Bernier Show, DRFTV, live.drf.com, livestream.com, the Daily Racing Forms Twitter handle, that would be at DRF Inside Post, as well as the Daily Racing Forms Facebook page. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter, at Bernier underscore Matt. This is the recap edition of the Matt Bernier Show. Going back and taking a look at some stakes action from this past weekend, May the 12th, 2018. If you are listening, podcast form. YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, video.drf.com. If you listen on YouTube, click that subscribe button. You will get all the latest offerings from DRF TV right there on your YouTube homepage. And again, give us those thumbs up. Help push everything out there that DRF TV has to offer. Uh, Just some housekeeping coming up this week later on. We'll have the preview edition of the Matt Bernier Show, Preakness edition. Uh, I will also briefly at the beginning of that show touch on the federal ban being lifted on Sports wagering, and now it is legal uh, federally as far as sports betting is concerned. Now it goes to a state level, but again, that was the breaking news here. This is being recorded on Monday. Uh, That was the breaking news, the big news on Monday, and it will be big news going forward because there's going to be some ramifications all over the place, but I'll dive into that a little bit in the preview edition for the Preakness coming up later this week. This is the recap edition, so let's recap some races. Again, we'll go over some graded stakes races from Belmont Park. We'll give you the stakes montage, and we'll also give you the weekend's best performances from a buyer speed figure standpoint. Kick things off with the only grade one of this past weekend, the Man of War. Mile and three sixteenths on the inner turf course. This was the field, a field of eight signed on. Your post-time favorite was High Happy for Todd Pletcher, going off at odds of 9-5. to five. The thing that makes High Happy very, very dangerous is that tactical speed that he brings to the table. And we found out on Saturday afternoon that the tactical speed, that made the difference. Here's Larry Colmus with the stretch run of the grade one man of war. Nation comes three wide. Call provisions down the center. Sadler's Joy's coming up on the far outside. One go, all go. Still there as they come into the final furlong. Try to shake away. High Happy runs at him on the outside. Call provision is coming. Sadler's Joy on the far outside. High Happy to the front. Sadler's Joy finishing fast but not getting there in time. High Happy takes the man of war. High Happy gets the job done for Pletcher and company. Luis Saez with the mount. Pays $5.90 on top. The number two Sadler's Joy does what he always does. Comes with an honest run, a serious late bid, finishes second at odds of 5-2. to two. And in third, the just raging form right now for one go, all go. He runs third at odds of 7-1. to one. He never gets respected in the wagering. All he does is show up and run and give you a good effort, though. Another nice one here from him. Let's talk a little bit more about the winner, shall we? He is high happy. He's 8 of 13 lifetime, bred in Argentina, over a million dollars in career earnings, owned by La Providencia LLC, trained by Todd Pletcher, bred by La Providencia in Argentina, ridden to victory again by Luis Saez, and you see the pedigree at the bottom of the page on the horse card by Pure Prize out of a French deputy mayor named Historia. 104 buyer speed figure, 128 time form U.S. rating for High Happy. He comes home in final quarter, uh, excuse me, final eighth of a mile in 11.38. For what it's worth, time form U.S. had the half, the three quarters, and the mile call all color-coded red, meaning they were fast, and then had the mile and a quarter call actually color-coded blue. So there was a little bit of an oddity because generally you don't see the race slow down at that stage, especially on turf, but that's how this race happened to be run. Perhaps a little bit of a double-edged sword when you look at it because that means a high happy was early on up pushing, well not pushing because he was about two or three lengths off of it, but he was close enough to a hot pace that perhaps that sapped a little bit out of him. But then as they hit the top of the lane, uh, maybe get a little bit of a breather out there. So hard to really analyze that too, too much. I think all around it was a very good effort from High Happy. Uh, and Sadler's Joy, you can, again, look at that a little bit of, of two different ways, where the fast fractions early on helped set up that late kick from him, but then perhaps that sort of breather there as the real running was getting going, perhaps that compromised him a little bit. I don't think it caused him to win. He finished in 1095. He got a 103 buyer and a 128 time form US rating. I think the top two both ran bang up races. And this is just kind of for for this level and at this distance, these are two of the horses that you're gonna have to keep an eye on going forward this year because the distance isn't gonna be an issue for them. And unfortunately, if you're a Sadler's Joy fan, you are going to need someone to just go out there and, and basically be on a crazy front end mission where we're just going to throw it down and go crazy. One go, all go is a nice horse, but he wasn't going just ballistic out there on the front end. He got a half and 49 and two. They're, you're going to need a, a, a serious pace. You're going to need a 47 and change for a horse like Sadler's Joy to be able to make up the difference with a horse like High Happy, simply because High Happy is always going to start his run ballpark five lengths ahead of Sadler's Joy. That's a lot to make up in a short amount of time. And we all know, Sadler's Joy, you got to time that ride beautifully. Julian Leperu, another beautiful ride on this horse. But it's just, 
whenever you give a tactical advantage up so significantly to a horse of, of comparable quality, like High Happy, it's going to be tough for you to make it up. But another good effort from Sadler's Joy, obviously a good effort from High Happy. I think a very good effort from One Go All Go. This is a horse for Scooter Dickey, raging form right now. You know his game. Just go out there, wing it on the front end. If you can back it down a little bit like they tried to do here in this race on Saturday afternoon, maybe that can propel you to a possibly a win. We saw that down at Keeneland, but more likely than not, a minor award, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing to sneeze at, running third in a grade one, and he just continues to cash checks. Really cool horse, very likable, and he continues to get disrespected at the windows. He's the kind of horse that you could really kind of tie your wagers into using him underneath, because if you don't think he can just actually get over the hump and get the job done against the best of the best, he can certainly offer value in here. What did he go off as? The fourth, fifth choice in this race? So uh, I think he's an interesting one, again, just to keep an eye on, because as long as he stays in form, He's going to keep running and keep giving you good efforts. I suppose the the horse, with the exception of Bigger Picture and Wake Forest, and I can say for both of them at seven and eight years old, perhaps they're over the top. Maybe they're just not at this caliber anymore. It happens to everyone. Father time catches up. The horse I'm probably most polarized by and slash disappointed in is Call Provision. Because Call Provision early on, Little bit of an oddity with Jose Ortiz. He breaks, he's mid-pack. I suppose maybe it was a little bit tight in between horses. Jose wrangles him back. The horse starts throwing his head. Really not loving life for that first quarter, even almost half mile. Then he gets into a nice relaxed beat in the clear toward the rear. And on the far turn, he starts to make a very, very eye-catching move. And it looks like turning for home, he's going to win for fun. And what happens, he ends up being call provision. He doesn't change leads at any point down the stretch, and he flattens out down the lane. Now, I suppose if you ran this race at a mile and a quarter or a mile and an eighth, he has a much better chance in here. But I think the lack of the lead change and maybe that little bit of expending energy early on when he wasn't comfortable, perhaps that hurt him. I still expected a better finish than we got out of him. The way that he moved on the far turn at the top of the lane, he just looked like he was going to roll by this field. And not only does he not win, he doesn't run second or third. He flattens out to run fourth. To me, a a disappointing effort. The early part, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt because clearly he wasn't comfortable. But at the same time, you got to finish a little bit better than that. He came home in 11.46. I expected a better finish. And again, the lack of lead change, that can kind of lead to that. But when it's all said and done, High Happy is a a red-hot horse right now for obviously a top-level barn in Todd Pletcher. He's got a top-level rider in Luis Saez. He has tactical speed. He can go a serious, serious distance of ground. And this is a legitimate horse. You've got to keep an eye on going forward if he stays healthy. You've got to be thinking races at Saratoga. And you know what? The connections can probably start to get to the point right now where they're looking at it saying, well, we saw Beach Patrol come back last weekend, and he a little bit disappointing that he couldn't get the job done. Uh, Yoshida's going to go overseas. Um... After that, maybe you're going to have some Europeans come over for a race like the turf, but high happy. Why doesn't he make sense in there? Forwardly placed, mile and a half's not a problem for him. Find out about Churchill Downs, but I got to be honest, if you're a fan of high happy, you should be feeling good or you're part of the connections. High happy's a legitimate, a legitimate long distance turf runner. He wins the grade one man award a mile and three eighths, 104 buyer, 128 time form US rating. Let's take a look at the field for the Grade 3 Peter Pan. This is the local prep at Belmont Park for the Belmont Stakes coming up in a few weeks. We'll find out if Justify is going for the Triple Crown or not. You had a field of six signed on for this year's Peter Pan. The favorite at post time, you had three horses that took a lot of money. You had Core Beliefs, who went off as the 2-1 to one favorite. You had High North, who went off as a slightly larger 2-1 to one shot. And then you had the 5-2 to two shot and Just Whistle coming out of a maiden score. That left a horse like Blended Citizen, who was technically on the outside looking in at the Kentucky Derby as the 21st entrant, off at odds of 9-2. to two. And guess what? He sat a pretty good trip, and he kicked home like a freight train. Larry Colmas with the stretch run. To their outside, trying to keep up, and they're into the stretch. And it's Core Beliefs. Core Beliefs and Tyler Bays have the lead and a furlong to go for the back of the pack. Blended Citizen is coming, though. It is Core Beliefs. Blended Citizen closing down the center of the track. Core Beliefs trying to hold on. Blended Citizen's got him. Blended Citizen wins the Peter Pan. Blended Citizen gets the job done, $11.40 on top as the 9-2 to two fourth choice in this year's Peter Pan. Core Beliefs runs a gallant second. We'll talk about that a little bit more as the 2-1 to one favorite. And then Just Whistle runs a non-threatening third at odds of 5-2 to two to round out your trifecta. Let's talk a little bit more about the winner, 
Blended Citizen. Blended Citizen is 3 of 10 lifetime, over $406,000 in career earnings, owned by Greg Hall and CJ Racing LLC, trained by Doug O'Neill, bred by Ray Hansen in Kentucky, ridden to victory by Kyle Frey, and you can see the pedigree at the bottom of the page. He is by Proud Citizen out of a Langfear mare named Langara Lass. Now we talk a little bit about the race itself. Blended Citizen earns a 90 buyer speed figure in a 122 time form US rating. Core Beliefs 88 buyer, 122 time form US rating. When you look at the final eighth of a mile for each of these two runners, though, stark contrast. You had Blended Citizen come home in 1276. You had Core Beliefs come home in 1353. Now, some of that has to do with the dynamics of how the race was run because you had a horse like Core Beliefs out there, broke a little bit on the slow side, pushed up early on. And although Timeform US doesn't have the fractions color-coded one way or the other, I happen to think this was a pretty pretty legitimate pace signed on here because the opening quarter may have been on the slower side, 23 and 4, but they really ramped it up there in that second quarter. You look, they got 47 for the half mile. That means they went all of a sudden a 23 and 1 for the second quarter mile, and they were really throwing it down between this horse, Core Beliefs, Just Whistle. He even had High North who was up in there breathing down their necks. And then that third quarter, they got out to 11 and 2. So I think the real racing picked up in the middle stages of this one and the fact that core beliefs was able to put away just whistle put away high north and he kept going on and fought on okay no match for blended citizen but that was a good effort from core beliefs blended citizen on the other hand the interesting thing about him he finishes as well as he does and he wasn't entirely outrun like he has been in some other races which to me is a very very important thing going forward because i talk about it all the time when talking about a race like the belmont stakes mile and a half the races are not won by deep closers they're won by horses that have a little bit of tactical speed, don't get outrun, will stay all day, and have a little bit of finish at the end. If all of a sudden Blended Citizen has the ability to be that close to the pace and still come home with a nice finish, he galloped out very, very strong, all of a sudden Blended Citizen becomes a legitimate, interesting alternative to a horse like Justify or a Good Magic or a Vino Rosso or any of those horses that are bypassing the Preakness coming up this weekend and waiting for the Belmont Stakes. I think Blended Citizen ran a very good race, and I, I talked about it during his earlier three-year-old campaign. I didn't like how he ran on dirt as a two-year-old. I thought he was just a turf horse and a synthetic horse. And then all of a sudden, in the bluegrass, he at least showed me anyway that dirt might not be out of the question for him. Then he comes back with a race like this. I think Blended Citizen is blossoming into a nice little three-year-old here. He's going to need to improve from a speed figure standpoint, but that's not totally out of the question. And again, love that finish. Kyle Frey, nice ride here, sitting in, waiting, finally tips out, comes with that run. Core beliefs, I've made mention, I think this is a better race than it might even look on paper. Wouldn't be surprised at all if all of a sudden we do go back and run in the Belmont Stakes and he is forwardly placed and perhaps Justify wants to sit off of him. I can't imagine that would be the case, but hypothetically, if this horse is out there and all of a sudden instead of a 47 half, you get a 48 and 3. It's a, it's a giant difference. You get three quarters and 13 as opposed to 11 and 4 or 11 and 2, excuse me. Maybe that speed carries a little bit farther. I don't think this was a bad effort from Core Beliefs either. Just Whistle, I liked him coming into this. I like him coming out of it. I think this was a lot to throw at him in a short amount of time. First time against winners, going a different configuration. One turn now, closer to the pace. He was actually on it. He had never been doing that. He was usually coming from farther off of it. I think he threw a lot at him, and I think he ran just fine. I don't think it was a great race, but I don't think it was a disaster. A little bit more concerning for a horse like High North. High North, they added blinkers for the first time most recently in the Northern Spur. Bang, he cracks, gets a 91 buyer. All of a sudden looks like he is onward and upward. And then in a race like this, when the real running started, he had absolutely nothing. Uh, I, I don't know what you want to do with him going forward out of this. I personally think he's a little bit shorter as far as distance is concerned, maybe a flat mile, maybe even seven-eighths of a mile. I would, wouldn't think it, out of the, the realm of possibilities that he comes back in a race like the Woody Stevens at seven-eighths. And I wouldn't think it's out of the realm of possibilities that they eventually do try these mile and an eighth races again down the road. Perhaps it is a race like the Haskell. But for the time being... I personally would like to see them turn him back a little bit, try to get him to a little bit of a better suited distance because I, I think he's better than what we saw on Saturday. For one reason or another, didn't show it. 81 buyer, 118 time form U.S. rating for High North. Going to need to do better than that against the big boys if he's going to be considered a legitimate threat in this three-year-old division. But I, I do think the top two, should they both enter the Belmont? We know the winner is Blended Citizen. Should Core Beliefs come back in the Belmont? I think they're both interesting for different reasons. But you really do need to keep an eye on Blended Citizen. If all of a sudden this running style is actually what he has, if he can sit a little bit closer to the pace, you think the distance isn't going to be a problem for him based on the way that he runs. 
Blended Citizen becomes an interesting alternative three weeks from now or four weeks from the time this is being recorded in a race like the Belmont Stakes. We'll find out. Going to need to improve from a speed figure standpoint, but distance doesn't look like it's a problem for Doug O'Neill. Blended Citizen, 90 buyer, 122 time form U.S. rating, winning the Peter Pan. Let's take a look at the first grade stakes race at Belmont on Saturday afternoon. This was the third race. This was the Vagrancy, a grade three event. $200,000 was the purse for Phillies and Mares. Four-year-olds and up, six and a half on the main. Field of six were signed on in here. Your post-time favorite was Holiday Disguise. One of two in here for Linda Rice. Also had Sounds Delicious. They were both a couple of nice runners. They were actually the first two choices in the wagering. You had one of them that went off at seven to five, one of them that went off at two to one. Uh, the speed was going to come from Sounds Delicious. The question was how fast would she go? And you had Holiday Disguise, who was likely to take back off. You had a horse like Shalone making her second star for Arnaud Delacour. A nice horse, and if she could work out a good trip, a likely win contender. And then after that, you had some longer prices. As we know, anything can happen in horse racing. And even when you watch and look, and the way it looks like things are going to end up going one way during the course of a race, something else happens. To me, that's kind of what happened here in this race. Here's the stretch run of the vagrancy. One, two for the half, and they're into the stretch. Shalone on the outside. Sounds delicious. Keeps on battling. In the center, it's Kirby's Penny. More work to do for Holiday Disguise. She's not going on with them. Now swings to the outside. Here comes Kirby's Penny now. Kirby's Penny hits the front. Shalone back into second. Holiday Disguise and Sounds Delicious. It's Kirby's Penny to win the vagrancy. And Shalone... Kirby's Penny, when it looks like she basically is all done on the far turn. She re-rallies on the outside, and she gets the better of Shalone in deep stretch. She wins as the 7-1 to one fifth choice, fourth choice, excuse me, in this race. Pays $16.20. The second place finisher is Shalone. She went off at odds of 3-1. to one. She had a beautiful trip, looked like she was in cruise control, and she just didn't have the finish when needed, perhaps distance. It's a little bit of a bugaboo for her. Maybe she's better at a flat six as opposed to six and a half. And the third place finisher was your seven to five favorite in here. Holiday Disguise. Irad was riding her very confidently. She's down toward the inside throughout on the far turn. When the real running started, she just did not have any sort of answer for those top two finishers. And the pace setter sounds delicious fades to run fourth. Let's take a look a little bit more at Kirby's Penny, the winner of the vagrancy. Seven of 12 lifetime, over $338,000 in career earnings, a shy beneath 339000 Owned by Kent Spellman, trained by Wesley Ward, bred by Hidden Springs Farm in Kentucky. Written to victory by John Velasquez. You see the pedigree. She is by Macho Uno out of a Peace Rules mare named Spirit Seeker. 92 buyer, 121 time form U.S. rating. 89 buyer, 121 time form U.S. rating for Shalone. Uh, the half mile for time form U.S. was color-coded red, meaning it was fast. Perhaps a horse like Sounds Delicious was the one that kind of took the brunt of that because she went out there, went 22-1 and and 45 for the opening fractions in this race. When you look at the way that these girls finished down the lane, Kirby's Penny comes home in 31-11. You have a horse like Shalone who comes home in 31-54, and then everyone else considerably slower. I still do wonder if Shalone is better at six furlongs as opposed to six and a half. And Kirby's Penny is a nice horse. It's hard to knock what she's done. Nine times in the exact from 12 lifetime starts. From a speed figure standpoint, when I look at this race, though, I think there was a, a major sort of chasm between the horses that run in races like the Madison and run in races like the Humana Distaff and the girls that are running in this race here. Kirby's Penny, again, it's not you can't knock a horse that shows up and runs, but from a fig standpoint, the 92 and the 121, it's a little bit on the light side as opposed to some of the bigger girls in this division. And I think the biggest girl of them all, Selcourt on the West Coast, she's going to try two turns in her next race, but ultimately I think she is a one-turn kind of horse. And if that's the case, these girls have a long way to go if they're going to get up to her level. But take nothing away from the connections. Ward, John Velasquez had a big day on Saturday. Uh, Kirby's Penny, she's a nice filly. She shows up, she runs her race. And the oldest girl in the bunch, the five-year-old mayor, she gets the job done in the vagrancy over the four-year-old whippersnappers. 92 buyer, 121 time form U.S. rating. The ninth at Belmont Saturday was a graded stakes race on the turf for Phillies and Mares. This is the field for the grade three Bogey. Field of seven signed on. You've always got to respect Chad Brown when he shows up in these graded stakes races. Not uh, breaking any news there. When Chad shows up, it usually means business. He had two in this instance. He had the favorite at post time, inflexibility ridden by Javier Castellano. He also had the second choice. At 5-2, to two, making her North American debut, a horse called the Raving Beauty, a German bred ridden by Arad Ortiz Jr. Well, guess what? She ended up getting the better of the horse that's been based here in the States in flexibility. Here's the stretch run from Larry Colmas. 
and seven they're into the stretch and a raving beauty is now a length behind and running at her team of teams and now a raving beauty goes on by a raving beauty to the front in flexibility and Lido are closing the gap into second and third but a raving beauty is looking good in her u.s debut a raving beauty won it by four over in flexibility and Lido. A raving beauty gets the job done for Chad in her North American debut. At odds of five to two, pays seven dollars seventy cents on top in flexibility. Defeated as the even money favorite, runs second, and then your third place finisher is Lido going out for Kira McLaughlin. Finishes third with eleven to one odds at post time assigned to her. As far as the winner is concerned, the German bred. A raving beauty. She's four of 18 lifetime, over $319,000 in career earnings. Owned by Michael Dubb, Madigan Stables, LLC, and Bethlehem Stables, LLC. Trained by Chad Brown. Bred by Gestud Karlsov. I hope. Don't know. Uh, over in Germany. Ridden by Erad Ortiz Jr. In the pedigree at the bottom of the page, she's by Mas Master Craftsman. Out of a high chaparral mare named Anabasis. Uh, 98 buyer, 125, uh, 124, excuse me, time form US rating. Really, this horse finished about as impressively as she could have. She broke very alertly, forwardly placed. Chad was a little bit surprised in the post race quotes about how sharply she did actually break. Forwardly placed, sits just off of the speed, the pace setter, a team of teams. Tips out, turn for home. Really under a stranglehold by Arad. Finally, when he lets her go, she finishes full of run. Ears are up at the end. Love and life. Comes home in 28.33. Uh, the next fastest final uh, come home time was Lido. She came home in 28.54. So uh, considerably faster, and especially considering she got a big jump on her. I think Raving Beauty is very, very talented. We'll find out. Ultimately, uh, Timeform US had the half-mile call color-coded blue meaning it should have favored horses that were forwardly placed. So perhaps that diminishes from her effort a little bit. But I have to be honest with you, visually, this checked all the boxes. Now the question becomes, how does she handle better company? It's not that this was a, a star-laden field here in the Bogey, but at the same time, she wasn't beating a bunch of ham and eggers. She was beating a decent enough field. And if you think that with more time here for Chad, more time to get acclimated, that she's going to take another step forward here and she can get into the low 100s as far as buyers are concerned. She can approach the 127, 128 range on Timeform US's scale. Then look, she could be a legitimate grade one threat for Phillies and Mares. Um, we'll take it one thing at a time, but I have, to, I have to be honest, I was very impressed with this effort. Inflexibility, surprised she was a little bit farther off the pace because it seems like she does her best running when she's a little bit more forward and you see the fractions 25 and 3, 49 and 4 over good going. Figured she'd be a little bit more forwardly placed. Didn't run poorly, but a little bit of a lackluster effort. Lido is Lido. I think she's an okay horse. Just okay. Don't think she's quite graded stakes caliber. A team of teams couldn't have asked for anything more as far as the pace was concerned. Simply not good enough. I liked her in this spot, but it is what it is. Uh, the disappointment of the race was my impression for Suge. Uh, never really offered any kind of threat. Never looked like she was all that interested. Galloped out a little bit awkwardly. Um, maybe that's one that you're going to want to keep an eye on because her first start off of the layoff was le less than stellar and her second start here in this race, not that good. So perhaps we're at a point in five years old, maybe my impression is starting to tail off and go the wrong direction. A five-year-old that seems like she has gone the improve is a raving beauty for Chad Brown. She wins her North American debut in the Bogey, 98 buyer, 124 time form U.S. rating. Only graded stakes race out at Santa Anita on Saturday was the Grade 3 Las Barreras, 7 eighths of a mile for three year olds on the main track. Let's take a look at the field. You had six signed on in here. Baffert had two big names in here, but I think most people were most interested in the horse that ultimately was the post time favorite at six to five. That was Kent Thaka for Jerry Hollendorfer and Flavian Pratt, turning back in distance, getting back to a one turn race after trying the bluegrass in Kentucky uh, at Keeneland. I can understand why they tried. Because they had a very talented horse, but it felt like all along, this is what he wanted to do. And guess what? He excels going 7 eighths, excels going one turn. Here's the stretch run with Michael Rona with the call. Length. Now Kentaka's getting a dream run through for Pratt and is quick to move up and challenge. And beautiful shot still there, whacking away, followed by Zulfikar and Bo Cephas, King Cause. Kentaka reaches the lead. Beautiful shot running a strong race. Zulfikar down the outside. Kentaka from beautiful shot. Kentaka owns the seven furlong shoot. Beats Michael wins the grade three Laz Barrera with an 88 buyer speed figure and a 114 time form US rating pays $4.40 as the 6 to 5 favorite. Second place finisher, ah, uh, thought he ran so well and I liked him and unfortunately couldn't quite get the job done. Beautiful shot at odds of 9 to 1 and third, a disappointing third and a disappointing fourth. 
of the Baffert duo of Zulfikar and Mikhail. Zulfikar goes off at 5-1. to one. Mikhail goes off at 6-5. to five. Let's take a look at Kentaka. He's 3 of 6 lifetime, over 263,000 in career earnings. Owned by West Point Thoroughbreds, trained by Jerry Hollendorfer. Bred by Spendthrift Farm LLC in Kentucky. We talked about Flavian Pratt. Another beautiful ride here. Bred by, he's out, I say bred by. He's by Jimmy Creed. I have a noon mark mare named Slice Bread. I brought up the figs. The figs are a little bit concerning here because they're a little on the light side. An 88 buyer and a 114 time form US rating. Beautiful shot with an 87 buyer and a 115 time form US rating. And then you've got the Baffert duo, Zulfikar and Mikhail. Both of them earned 84s, but Zulfikar earned a 112, Mikhail a 114 time form US rating. Something else that is very, very interesting about the way that this race was run and the way that time form US views the racetrack at Santa Anita on Saturday. They had the track color coded in the bright blue meaning it was favoring horses intensely coming from off of the pace. Now, that's exactly what Kentaka did. Kentaka was much closer to the pace, but that, to me, is predominantly because they didn't go fast early on. The opening quarter was in 23 seconds flat. That's walking for horses of this caliber, particularly a McHale. But look, the fact that beautiful shot, and I thought it was a great ride from Kent to Sormo. Kent recognized there was no speed signed on, so he goes up, brushes out in the clear, and pushes the pace going into the far turn. The, the difficult thing there is beautiful shots... His M.O., his calling card throughout his career has been coming from off of it. But I can understand every reason why DeSormo did what he did, and I don't have any complaints about it. I thought it was a great ride. But then when you see Flavian Pratt, who was sitting in the pocket throughout, again, a little bit closer to the pace than, than this horse Kentaka is accustomed to, because the pace wasn't materializing. And then when you combine that with Time Form US suggesting that the main track was favoring horses coming from off of it, now all of a sudden you've got a recipe for a horse that had everything go his way, and, okay, do you want to be betting on that next time out? I think Kantaka is a very, very talented horse, but it seems like he had the best of it. Conversely, a horse like Beautiful Shot taking a little bit out of his element, closer to the pace, wants to come from out of it. I wonder if he and Kantaka started their runs at the same point with the same sort of running style. Uh, do we have a different result? Because they were only separated by three quarters of a length when it was all said and done. A horse like Zulfikar was a little bit closer to the pace. A, a difficult call here is with Mikhail, because... I wasn't as enamored as some other people with McHale. I thought he was a very talented horse, but some people were just putting a ring around him saying, can't lose. Um, the tactical advantage that he had, I don't want to excuse that because although he was pushed a little bit early on, they didn't go that fast. Could have easily seen this pace heating up had the other pace stayed in the race. With him out there by himself, I understand why everyone else kind of was taken out of their element and they had to push it. Otherwise, they thought this horse would have just walked out there. It's a tough sell, though, when you look and, again, you factor in the time form piece saying that the track was favoring horses coming from off of it. You need to make a decision as a handicapper. Does the fact that the track was fl had, a, had a closer's flow negate the fact that this horse was out there on the lead? Or did he still walk on the front end and he just was no match when the real running started and he's just not as good as these horses? Very difficult call for me with Mikhail going forward. I don't know if this was a, a better-than-looks effort or it was as bad as I kind of feel like it was. I think Hantock is very good. I wouldn't be surprised if we kept him at these one-turn races. Uh, I, I don't think he should stretch back out. I've talked about it ad nauseum. Jimmy Creed, when I see Jimmy Creed, he was a brilliant sprinter, and I don't think he won any distance. I think Hantock is very much the same. I'm, I'm happy that Beautiful Shot has finally got back to one of those races that he ran as a two-year-old because I've thought that there's more there in the tank than what we've seen, and he shows up with an effort like this. I think there's a race for Beautiful Shot somewhere. I think with some serious pace in here, early in front of him, he can come with an effort from off of it. I don't know if it's a race like the Woody Stevens. I don't know if down the road it's a race like the H. Allen Jerkins, but I think there's a race for Beautiful Shot somewhere. And again, off of a race like this, I don't think he's going to have the sexiest paper because the figure hasn't come back that fast. And unless you really paid attention to the little nuances of the racetrack and the way that he normally runs, I think there's a scenario where Beautiful Shot down the road at a big number or a square number, we'll leave it at that, could upset some sort of a race when people on paper don't think he has much of a chance. Um, but having said that, he didn't get the job done in the last borough. The winner and the deserving winner, you can say what you want. I know the Red Sea parted and he just tipped out, but beautiful patient ride from Flavian Pratt. He knew he had a good horse and a nice training job from Jerry Hollendorfer. Kantaka wins the Las Barrera, 88 buyer, 114 time form U.S. rating.
Last race will recap on this week's edition of the Matt Bernier Show. We'll go to Sunday's race of the day. It was the Grade 3 Marine up at Woodbine, north of the border in Toronto, Canada, in the Toronto area anyway. Mile and a 16th on the main track for three-year-olds. You had a, ho- a couple of hopefuls for a race at the Queen's Plate later on. But unfortunately, this race was pretty well dominated by two horses that were bred in Kentucky, so they are not eligible to run in a race like the Queen's Plate. But nonetheless, they're both very, very talented horses, in my opinion. Your post-time favorite was Okratos. He went off just shy of 2-1. to one. He was stretching out in distance. The question was, could he successfully get out to this two turns? Could he handle maybe a little bit of a different pace situation? Guess what? He handled it all in spades. Very, very good effort from him. Here is the stretch run of this year's Marine. Is coming. Ingi tackled by Okratos. Mark Tree up the inside is running on, but Okratos is race clear. Mark Tree on the inside giving chase down the lane in the Marine Stakes. It's Okratos and Mark Tree finishing pretty well. Okratos in front. Mark Tree can't get there. And Okratos by three quarters. Mark Tree. Okratos gets the job done. $5.90 on top. The runner-up is Mock Tree for Mark Cassie and Patrick Husbands. Comes home like a freight train, finishes second at odds of three to one, or seven to two, excuse me. And third is ahead by a century at odds of ten to one. Let's take a look a little bit more about the winner, Okratos. He's three of six lifetime right now, over 121000 in career earnings, owned by Turdick Farms Limited, Sharon Bonder, and Walter M. Bannock, trained by Darwin Bannock. Bred by Dr. H. Steve Conboy in Kentucky. Ridden to victory by Eureka Rosa da Silva. And you can see the pedigree. He's by Curlin out of a Dixieland band mare named Shag. Now we get to, this is one of those difficult things. From a speed figure standpoint, they did not come home blisteringly fast, but they came home respectable, which I don't know what to do with the buyer. The buyer of 82 is eh, a little light. Um... But I like the way that he ran. He came home in 3105. I think this is a talented horse. I still don't know if this distance is is ideal for him. He he can do it. He's capable at it. But I do wonder if you got any farther than this, do you have a bit of a problem? Do you think that a mile and a 16th is limitations and he's better suited going slightly shorter? That's kind of where I'm leaning right now, but it's so early in his career. He's only raced six times. No reason to think that he can't continue to mature. The 82 buyer needs to improve, no question about it. But I think he's a nice horse. I am fascinated by Mock Tree. I think Mock Tree is a very, very talented animal. His first start up at Woodbine, two starts back, very green, lugging in the length of the stretch. Eh, you know, going to have to be much more professional. This time around, there's not a crazy pace signed on, 24, 48, 12, and 3 for three quarters. He is way out of it, way out of it down on the inside. And he starts rolling on the far turn. And when they get to just about the quarter pole, Patrick Husbands goes to hit him left-handed, and somehow the whip goes flying got nothing there this horse all of a sudden he still goes on and finishes very very well underneath essentially just kind of a hand ride i'm not suggesting that the whip would have made a difference but it certainly wouldn't have hurt having the whip down deep stretch trying to catch this horse that's out there he finishes in 30 22 i thought this was a really really strong effort from mock tree i wish he was an ontario bred because i'd be interested in him going forward for a race like the queen's plate but unfortunately he's not we'll find out ultimately where they decide to move this horse but i think mock tree he's learning he's putting it together to me he's a horse with additional distance not going to be a problem for him and i think again the, the maturation you're seeing it already i, I don't want to take anything away from the winner okratos but i think mock tree is a very very talented horse with a pretty bright future and it'll be interesting to see what cassie and company decide to do with this horse again dropping the whip Coming from so far out of it in a race that didn't have a ton of pace signed on. Get some additional distance. He's learning. I think Mock Tree is a horse to keep an eye on going forward. But the winner on this day in the grade three Marine, no question about it. Okratos, he gets the job done with an 82 buyer speed figure. We're going to take a look right now at this week's stakes montage. Go back some of the races that we are unable to go back and do a full recap with. We go. We'll give you the stretch runs of those. We'll come back. We'll get you the weekend's best buyer speed figures performances. And then we'll move on from there, get you ready for the DRF TV schedule of events for this upcoming week, Preakness Week. So without further ado, let's get into this past weekend stakes montage. 45.56. They're into the stretch. And Westwood has taken the lead. Pulling away from Skyler's Scramjet. Always Sunshine is next on the outside trying to get involved. King Kranz is fourth. Westwood down to the 16th pole. 
A length and a half clear. Skylar Scramjet, always sunshine on the outside. It is Westwood. Westwood wins the run, happy three quarters of a length. Sky for the wire, closer still in front. Joined and Dream It Is on the outside, has gone to the front. Sly Beauty trying to run them both down. And Sly Beauty is coming really well. Sly Beauty after Dream It Is. And Sly Beauty on the outside, coming home a bit the better. On the rail, closer still. Sly Beauty. Out wide on the track has got on to win. Sly Beauty is the upset winner. Closer still. Now Pratt bringing moonshine memories to the extreme outside. She has three lengths to pick up. Show it and mow it near the fence. Emboldened running on at the eighth pole. First two debts a length in the front of 13 squared. True royalty moonshine memories and emboldened with a thundering finish out wide. Emboldened from a clear second last. Powers away with the Angels flight. Taken in hand late. Beats moonshine memories two and a half. Outside four lengths clear of three rolls and sweet on the ladies. Three sixteenths to go. It's a street fight up front on the outside mr jordan toward the rail croy shoulder to shoulder but mr jordan doing the better work at the 16th pole he edges away croy is back to second to land and high riverside running on for a slice mr jordan wins the big drama croy second very commencing her bid they're at the top of the stretch and burned is let loose with a powerful bid for the lead Viva Vegas has come up empty. At the rail, a place to shine is running on. Then Teresa Z, followed by Indian Paint. But it's a big day for Jersey Joe Bravo. His third comes aboard, burned, to win the Serena song with style. A place to shine with second. Forrest drifting. Engage comes up alongside. They're dead even. Engage on the outside. Engages Forrest and takes the lead. Forced is not done yet, though. Battling on under Edgar Prado from the rail. The two of them neck and neck, stride for stride. Engage on the outside. Forced won't go away. Engage and Forced, they come down to the line together. And it wasn't easy, but... It... Lloyd in front. One and a half. Looking for purse money on the outside. Trying to make a race of this. Pink Lloyd has other ideas, and just like water off a duck's back, is just rolling so smoothly. And again, we go to see another stakes win. Day 10 at the meet, a 10th stakes win in succession. Just gets so easy. Pink Lloyd could not have won. There you have it, this week's stakes montage wrapped up with the king of Woodbine, Pink Lloyd. He goes out there and struts his stuff in the new Providence. This is a very, very talented animal, and he is just razor sharp. You hope nothing but the best for a horse like this. He's very cool. He's very easy to root for. Just goes out and continues to put forth major, major efforts. Let's find out if that effort landed him in the weekend's best performances from a buyer speed figure standpoint here on the Matt Bernier Show, the recap edition. As we always do, doesn't matter age, gender, distance, surface, you name it, we've got it covered for you. Here they are, the best performances of the past weekend from a buyer speed figure standpoint. Three-year-old males, totally boss. 93 buyer speed figure winning a maiden special weight affair down at Churchill Downs. Three-year-old fillies emboldened for Bob Baffert coming from off the pace this time. Wins the Angels fight at Santa Anita with an 84 buyer. Three-year-old turf males. Carrick, 81 buyer. Maiden claiming event at Belmont Park. Three-year-old fillies on turf. Punked and Fernandina, or Fernanda, excuse me. F Ferdinanda. Jeez, try that one. 82 buyer speed figure to non-winners of one other than at Belmont Park. Older males, and I brought it up the last time Pink Lloyd ran. In the internal database for the Daily Racing form, we, the dirt and the synthetic is not separated, so occasionally you will have a giant effort on synth work its way into these sort of performances. So the older males, it may not have been on dirt, but the one-on-one -on -one buyer earned by Pink Lloyd in the New Providence at Woodbine, that was the best performance of the weekend from an older male. So hats off, well done to the old boy Pink Lloyd. Older female, Kirby's Penny. We saw her win the vagrancy at Belmont Park with a 92 buyer speed figure. Older male on turf, high happy. We saw him at the top of the show win the grade one man of war with a 104 buyer at Belmont. And the older female on turf, a raving beauty for Chad Brown, 98 buyer, winning her North American debut in the Bogey at Belmont Park. Those are the weekend's best performances from a buyer speed figure standpoint here on the Matt Bernier Show. That's going to wrap things up. But before we put a button on this thing, let's go on over and take a look at the DRF TV schedule of events for this upcoming week. Uh, little race is going on Saturday. I'm sure you've heard of it. <clears throat> it's called the Preakness. Three-year-olds, it's the second jewel in the United States Triple Crown. We'll find out if Justify can get that second jewel. Again, keep in mind, Baffert, whenever he has had a derby winner, he has gone on to win the Preakness. So, uh, all things looking positive for Justify at this point, but he's going to have to deal with good magic, and he's going to have to deal with some new shooters. Speaking of new shooters, there are new shooter Preakness 
profiles up on video.drf.com as well as the Daily Racing Forms YouTube channel. You can go over and check those out and you'll have all the usual stuff here from all of our different correspondents. You'll have Out of the Gate. You'll have the Matt Bernier Show. You'll have the DRF Players Podcast. You have Formulator Angles. You name it. It's out there, the DRF Breeding Report. It's all out there for you to find it anywhere you'd like. Head on over to video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Forms YouTube channel. Uh, that's going to wrap up the recap edition of the Matt Bernier Show. If you've been listening live, live.drf.com, livestream.com, Daily Racing Forms Twitter handle, at DRF Inside Post, or the Daily Racing Forms Facebook page. Thank you for doing so. If you listen to podcasts, YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, video.drf.com. If you listen on YouTube, click that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up. You'll get all the latest that we have from the DRF TV family of offerings. You'll get it all right there on YouTube if you watch on the Daily Racing Forms YouTube channel. If you want to follow me or interact on Twitter, at Bernier underscore Matt, if you are on YouTube or you just want to fire away questions, comments, concerns, whatever else it may be, fire away at me either on Twitter or in the comments section below the video. Uh, we will be back with the preview edition of the Matt Bernier Show. It will be Preakness-centric. We'll touch on the sports betting situation and how that could affect everything going forward uh, and all sorts of other good stuff. So until we speak again on Friday, best of luck however you're playing, whatever you're playing, wherever you're playing. This is the Matt Bernier Show.